Hey, everybody, it's Mark Patterson. I'm back once again and again for another incredible episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding your way. And this week, I've got an amazing guest, Rocky Blyer. And if there's anybody that I've talked to, this guy epitomizes what this show is all about, finding your summit and overcoming serious adversity and just keep fighting and fighting and fighting until uh, he made his way through life and Super Bowls and a lot of amazing things after that. But before we get to Rocky, we'll get to him in just a minute. I just wanted to remind everybody about what's going on today. It's crazy times. It's mid-March and everybody's isolated. We're dealing with coronavirus. Uh, I was scheduled to go to Mount Everest on the 31st of March, uh, like everything else in the world. It got put on hold. First, they shut down the south, I'm sorry, the north from China. And and now they just recently, a couple of days ago, shut down the south. So I was scheduled to land in Nepal. I'm no longer doing that. But the good news is it's not canceled for me. It's just postponed, like many things. Rocky and I will talk about that in terms of postponing things that you have on the schedule you think you're going to do and you push those things out. And so I'm very blessed to be able to still have those in my sights. So 2021, it is back into the daily grind of, of, of training like I continue to do. And so again, if, if anybody wants to uh, see exactly uh, what I'm up to, um, you can do that at my website, www.markpattisonnfl.com. And again, you can see on my blog, Everest blog, what's going on, how I'm going about it, so on and so forth. There's also another tab on there. I've been successfully raising money towards my daughter who has epilepsy. Her name is Amelia, and her campaign is called Amelia's Everest. So we've now reached just under $30,000. The original goal was $29,029 for her to reach her summit. And now we're going to go for, I think we're going to double it. And uh, since we have another year to do this, and see what kind of progress we uh, can do with that. So on that note, let's get to my guest of the day, Rocky Blyer. Rocky, how you doing? I'm doing fine, Mark. Man, I, like, like, I, like I said to you before we went live here, you know, you're a guy that um, I've known, I grew up with, idolizing so many teams, the, 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 the famous – you know, Pittsburgh Steelers teams of the 70s playing against the Raiders, who I ended up getting drafted by. And you guys racked up four Super Bowls. And you just had this remarkable career. And and I, I, I can't remember where I saw a post on you. Actually, I do. It, I, I saw a, a clip that ESPN had done about you returning to Vietnam. And we'll get there here in a bit. But it was such a heartfelt story that I said to myself, I don't know how this is going to happen, uh, but I need to get this guy on my podcast because he's got so many life stories and, and so many great qualities um, that can be shared about not giving up. And, and, and I want to get into this, but I think it's important to me because this is my interpretation, a little bit of your story. And as I was researching and writing all this stuff down, I noticed you're from Appleton, Wisconsin. I've now been to Appleton, Wisconsin many, many times. There's the one and only hotel that you can stay at. And for those who don't know, you're about 30 miles or so, so away from uh, Green Bay. Um, obviously, that's where the Packers play. And um, just a, a famous, but, but your dad raised, raised you guys. You, 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 uh, your family um, was located above the family bar. Is that right? That's right. Yes. So <clears throat> obviously, I'm going to share this with you today, is that uh, today is St. Patrick's Day as we're recording this podcast. Yep. Uh, and it was the day that uh, I was baptized. So prior to today, I was baby boy flyer, aka The Rock. Yep. Then my name was Robert Flyer. But because I was um, baptized, uh, baptized on, on this day, it's, I got Robert Patrick Flyer. So it's a special day, 74 years ago on yeah. this day. A name only used by my mother and the Notre Dame nuns who taught me in grade school. <laughs> Robert Patrick, what are you doing? <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about that period of time as we compare it to what we're going through today. 
uh, in, to, in, in some degree with the, the, the virus that has taken place um, and the uncertainty of, uh, of what we do, um, the, how can I say this, the, the, the staying home, uh, it, not being in crowds, you know, and you're spending more family time to some degree uh, today was, uh, was what took place back in the 50s as I was growing up in Appleton, Wisconsin. Because all you had was just your neighbors and your family, and, uh, uh, and, and that's what you share. And sometimes we miss sight of that in the hustle bustle of a world in which we live. Things that we take, that we, we think that are important, you know, uh, that takes time away from maybe the essential part of what life is all about. And so rather than being uh, under stress, you know, maybe it's a time just to take a look and to share and to come together and say, it'll change, but let's enjoy this period of time. So that's kind of my response to Appleton, Wisconsin, uh, and, and, and growing up in, uh, in that period of time and, and uh, kind of what's, what's happening uh, today and, and how important family was and your neighbors and the kids that you grew up with and you know, it wasn't crowds and it wasn't traveling. Uh, it wasn't uh, <clears throat> people, two families, uh, I mean, to <laughs> both parents working. And um, uh, and so it was just a, it was a different time for all us baby boomers who had come through that period. I think part of that, going back in time a little bit, you're talking about kind of taking a time out and things. You know, I grew up, you know, pre-internet too. Uh, in Seattle, Washington, is where Microsoft and Starbucks and Expedia and Amazon and all these big other big companies, you know, blossomed out of there. But you know, before that, you're picking up a, a phone and either dialing or <laughs> pushing buttons, right? And you weren't taking this thing in your hand and putting it in your your pocket and off you go with all these different technologies. Just like you and I right now, you're in. <laughs> where are you right now? That's a good question. Where Where are you right now? I'm in Pittsburgh. You're I'm in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. And, and you're in Sun Valley. Well, I'm actually <laughs> in, LA, in LA. Yeah, I came to LA because this is where I was supposed to launch for my my Everest. Uh, oh, that's and, right. Yes. Uh, so I'm I'm anchored here for just a bit, but you know, this the technology, and so I think the theme of 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 coming together and gathering and slowing things down, and I equate that a little bit to the sports because you were a three sports star which so many of us were back in the day, not necessarily the star part, but participating in multiple sports. And so today things are so specialized and it's just football or it's just basketball. It's going to, you know, these Nike elite 11 camps and all these other crazy things and parents getting like out of whack about, about their kid. And they think they're going to be the next Rocky Bly or Terry Bradshaw or somebody. And this like, the reality is, is that, only a small little percent of people, even if they have the talent, as you know, Rocky, you got to have the desire and desire can take you so far. Uh, and you're right, you know, and, and I think, you know, and I don't want to be that old guy looking back and how it was in the old days and yeah. um, as compared to today. But I think that I think from an athletic point of view, it becomes very important in your evolution as a person as an athlete, uh, and the skills that you learn in all different sports in which you get a chance to play. So rather than being involved in just one sport, whether it be soccer, which we didn't play back then, or just football because of all the camps, and just basketball or just baseball, uh, you, you, you just morphed from one season to another season because you played in the neighborhood, you played in rec teams, I played in organized sports and your buddies were playing football. So you did. And then you went on to basketball because that was the next season. And then you went on to either track or baseball. And so then the summer I played American Legion um, baseball and, uh, or rec league baseball. So, but, but the skill sets, one, you get focused. And then rather than being burned out, well, you got a new sport. And so you play that and you, and you enjoy that and you got another sport or whatever it is. And the skill sets of eye-hand coordination differ in each and every one of them. 
but yet combined, they make you a better whole person or a whole athlete. I just think at times as well that kids today get burnt out after a period of time, especially if you start playing at fourth grade or fifth grade and you go to camps and then you go travel team and then you're playing um, soccer and you might be play another sport in the spring, but then, or you may not, uh, but then all of a sudden it's that whole focus of by the time you're a freshman in high school, or even by the time you're a sophomore, so you just might get burned out or just don't have the fun of playing the game. So it has its pros and cons. I, I think the way we did it was was much more interesting and you know and better. And you're right, you know. And the focus is that who knows? Who knows? As if we've met athletes, who knows what sport you may end up in. Preston Pearson, who played with us, played with Baltimore, played with us for many years and finished his career with the Dallas Cowboys, was a basketball player, never played football hmm. and played basketball in college and was drafted um, by the Baltimore Colts at the time uh, to play a wide receiver flanker back. And he was a good athlete and he learned that position catching and ultimately became a running back ultimately he had a great career but he never played football until he got into the pros so you never know what's going to happen as you evolve within this uh within the within your life and uh within the the sports that you play well i, I think that always has there's a lot of ingredients that come into this right and and one is desire and two is being in the right place at the right time three is is having the right mentors around you, you know, coaches and your friends, and you don't fall into a druggy group or something. You know, there's all these things that play into it, right? And and right. the thing that I loved about your story because I had a similar story, um, not exact story, a uh, similar story, in that um, when you were in high school, you know, you stood out, right? And especially in football, right. and 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 because you stood out, and and your teams won all the time just like losing to you was such a foreign concept. You didn't know what that, and the same thing with me, I like losing. I, I mean, we lost here and there, but most of the time we were winning everything. Right. Right. And then, yes. and then, and then you're fortunate enough to get a scholarship to, especially back in the day. I mean, they're still elite, but it was the elite program back in the day. That is the university of Notre Dame. So it, it and, and you're right. What you're talking about is that, who knows what's going to happen within your playing career? Um, so let's just take the fact that I'm a baby boomer. So by 1960, my freshman year in high school, all of a sudden, by 58, 57, 58, we, the, the anticipation of more high schools need to be built because of this baby boomer movement that is, that is going to flood uh, the, the school system. So we have a brand new Catholic high school that uh, was built uh, in Appleton. When I got there, the first year was a two-year school. Then I got there, it was a three-year school. By my sophomore year, it became a four-year fledgling school into a new conference. And because it was a new school, we had this drawing power within the Fox Valley area in which Appleton exists. So we got guys from Nina and Menasha and Little Chute, Kakana and Kimberly, all these little townships around Appleton to come to this brand new um, high school. We also got a great coach and that's what becomes important, a mentor, being at the right place at the right time guy by the name of Torchy Clark, who was a great school basketball coach and had continuous winning records, got the high school job. So he took a bunch of guys, and in that period of time that we were in the conference, we never lost a football game, and we lost four basketball games. We became the number one team in the state of Wisconsin and then in football and the number one team in basketball. Won the state championship my junior year, lost the state championship 
my senior year. So it was a, you know, it was a period of time where we put the school on a level of, 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 of being known, raised the standards. But we were just a bunch of kids that played well, great athletes that came together because we had a, a mentor, a coach, you know, that I always say a catalyst that, that got the most out of, of those guys by yelling, screaming, whatever he had to do, but he did. And we loved him for it. And we got the success. And because of that, as you will, so because of that, well, people recognize and you become somewhat known or you're a part of and uh, and and I get a I get a scholarship offer to go to the University of Notre Dame. I got you know several scholarships around the, the area, but I decided to go to Notre Dame. Well, and I'll tell you why is that being a good Catholic boy, you know, you you're taught you're taught to go to church and you know pray for guidance and, and direction and and then then like a good Catholic boy, I did what my mother wanted me to do and. That was to go to Notre Dame. So, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, but you end up at Notre Dame. Now you end up, and who knows? I, it wasn't because of anybody, but we had a brand new coach that came in that freshman year for me in 1964 by the name of Era Parsegian. Yep. He had come in from Northwestern University. Famous um, coach. I didn't know. Good coach. I didn't know Era. I did, you know, I knew Notre Dame. They had not been successful. Uh, through that period of time until era came, uh, latter part of the, or into from the 50s, 52 or so on, they, they were a mediocre team and, uh, and, and, and weren't on the, the, anybody's uh, horizon. Uh, the right place, right time. And, you know, era comes in and by my junior year, you're on the team that, that wins a national championship. You know, and I become captain of the team my senior. So all of a sudden you get recognized only because not you're the best or so on, but you're part of that group and you're part of that team. And I get drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now, I was not the first choice, just to put it in perspective. I was not there. I did not make their top 10 list. I, I was the 417th person picked in the draft back at that time. I was the 16th round draft choice, but they gave me a chance and an opportunity. And I think that's all we, you know, can ask for in our lives is just an opportunity. And it's what you do with that opportunity. And it's like, it's like the luck of the luck. Luck is based on what? Preparation, which means opportunity is called luck. <laughs> and yeah. so... You, you so you get there and things change uh, because of error procedure. Well, it was really interesting because again, going back and researching your story, you know, I knew kind of the big picture, the thirty thousand foot view of of right. you because I, I I can't tell you how many times I I saw you Terry Bradshaw and uh, Franco uh, Harris, you know, in the background and and when I was a little kid, I'd, I'd look up to guys like you. Um, and in the backyard, when I was throwing the football around, we would uh, be, um, you know, we pretend we're this player or that player. And so it was a lot of fun in that way. But the thing that made it really interesting to me was that when you got drafted, which was 1968, in the 16th round, you end up actually making that team. You end up making that team. So for a 16 round pick, I mean, it's inconceivable for me. I was a seventh round pick. I had a hard enough time trying to make the team. And when you're a 16th <laughs> rounder to actually make the team, but you did so in 1968. Tell me more about that. I felt like, how is that possible? And I think, you know, and, 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 I, had, and I really truly believe that the reason was, um, was primarily the fundamentals that I learned while I was at Notre Dame, how to read defenses, more importantly, how to block, pick up blitzes, a thought process on running the ball. I wasn't a I wasn't a fast guy. I wasn't the leading ground gainer at Notre Dame. Nick Getty was when I played with uh, with uh, with Nick. He was our perennial All American. But you fit into a system, and you know, and there's a certain belief in that system. And so, in in my case, you know, it's it's just that. Whatever they saw on special teams, um, in a work ethic, 
in the fundamentals of the game appealed to them at that that moment in time. And so I, I got a chance to, to, to make the team. I was uh, one of um, four rookies that made the team that year. That's incredible. I mean, you know, so so when I was looking at your timeline on your NFL experience, the thing I didn't, I wasn't quite understanding at first was that you played for the Steelers in 1968, then it jumps to 1970 to 1980. And I was like, well, what the hell happened? Right. (laughs) And and so as I, again, looking back at the timestamp, you know, 1968 was a really pivotal year for you. Um, you number one get probably have one of the greatest highlights of your life being drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers of all teams in April or May or something like that then off to camp and then actually making the team and then you turn around in December of 1968 and being drafted into the army so you know it's I it during that period of time and, and I'm only putting the perspective at that moment you know, I didn't, you know, you, you, you didn't know what was taking place. But 1968 was the height of the war. We had the most people uh, in Vietnam. We had over 500,000 troops over in Vietnam. But my thought process was, I, and I should say this, and my thought process was, well, if you make the team, I mean, if you make the team, something will happen. In the back of my mind, following the Packers, and I, I would watch them uh, or read articles about them going to um, summer camp, summer camp, boot camp, uh, spending weeks within the reserve or weekends at the reserve or the National Guard, because that was part of the process of for those who could get into the National Guard or needed to get in the team. I guess, got them in. That was my thought process. And so when I make the Steelers, probably the happiest day of my life at that moment was Bill Austin, who was the head coach after a meeting, took me aside and said, listen, uh, I, I, we got this letter in the mail and um, we opened it up accidentally. Uh, and it, uh, uh, it was my 1A classification uh, to go back being able to be drafted into the armed services. He said, we think you're good enough to make this team. We will take care of this obligation for you, whatever take care of this meant. And I'm just assuming, well, maybe a reserve or National Guard, whatever whatever life was going to take a uh, path. And, you know, so time went on. And obviously, because of the nature of what was taking place in Vietnam, things were full, as they said, the congressman got defeated. The general retired. All our contact people are now messed up, and um, and all of a sudden, I fell through the crowd, and, uh, and I got drafted uh, by uh, by the military. It was December of December second, nineteen sixty eight. So I got a chance to play ten of fourteen games. We're getting ready for the eleventh game, and, uh, and all of a sudden, boom. I got that draft notification and report the next morning at 7 a.m. to be inducted into the armed services. I mean, it was a turnover. To some degree, it, 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 it was a blessing because it, you had to react. Usually they give you a week notice to get your stuff together. But now I'm on the phone calling my parents, you know, picking up my car. Can you do this? I'm gone. And uh, and so uh, and, and you're gone and you're just bam, and go on to the next stage of your life. Um, and it's, and you just react, you know, it's like, it's in all, like in all sports or, or the transitions that we go through, you know, is that you go from high school, let's just, oh, you go from junior high to high school. Oh, it's a big transition from high school, you know, into college. Oh, it's another big transition. You go from freshman year to sophomore year to the varsity, you know, it's a big it's they're all big transitions. So, so now all of a sudden you don't think you just react. You go, okay, I'm in the army. And and then everything that you ever read or saw in the movies it becomes part of your nightmare <laughs> about drill sergeants, so on and so on. And so you just it, and you just kind of react every day to that situation. Your future is on hold. You don't think about the future. You just try to get through that day. That, that training, you know, and all of a sudden time goes on, you go through basic and you go through advanced infantry training. And then uh, 
I got my orders to to go to Vietnam. So hold on, hold on, hold on real quick. So I want to ask you this question. Again, this is coming from somebody who right. served in the military. And for me, it would be devastating having always that dream of playing in the NFL and then having that thing yanked out from under me. And and now you're going from, it's not just like you're going to from one school to another, like a transfer, but you're going to war. You're going to Vietnam, foreign country. So I, and, and we're, I'm going to ask you later about your reflections of going back to Vietnam as you look back on it. But I want to try to get you to go to that place where you were when you were 22, something like that, 22, 23 years old. And uh, I want to, like, in, in your mind, were you terrified from the standpoint, were, were you aware of the consequences of what was happening over there with us dropping bombs and people coming back completely messed up and PTSD and all these things. I mean, were, did you have a, an awareness of that at such a young age? No, you know, I really, Mark, I didn't. I mean, I, I knew that the, the war was taking place, you know, and the, I knew the same thing that everybody else knew, what, what you saw on television. And, uh, but, you know, as, as life takes you through this process, you know, I didn't really have time to worry about that. That was still in, that was in the future. I mean, so it was like getting through basic, getting through uh, the next stage of, of, of your training you know, waiting for an order or orders and, and your orders got down. Okay, fine. So then I got a chance to go home on a leave before I, I reported out to San Francisco. So my, and before I went to, to, to Vietnam. And so your mindset was just kind of, you know, like on automatic. And I have to say that I, I, I wasn't a big reflection of why me or, or how come I got to go or what took place or, or I didn't think about those who had been uh, killed in the past or, 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 or who had died. You just, you don't think about that. You just, you know, you get through that day, the next day and so on and see where it takes you. And, uh, and so you get, you fly over to, you know, to Vietnam and, and you land. And so you land and you didn't know what was going to take place, you know, and you're on this bus as you come off. And it's got uh, bar, uh, bars on the windows and heavy screens so that nothing could be thrown inside, hand grenades. Or, and you didn't know whether it was a war zone, what was going to happen. It, it's so you finally get to your unit. And I do remember, finally, as I was flown out to LZ West, attached to my uh, my group at that time, which was Charlie Company, 4th of the 31st, 196th Brigade, of the Marical Division, um, and uh, I was in the 1st Platoon, and uh, they weren't there, and I didn't know what the procedure was. We were on a landing zone. LZ West was one of the landing zones, and how Vietnam operated for combat soldiers was that your battalion had an area in which you covered. So you usually worked out of two landing zones. That's where all the artillery was on top, on a mountainside. And this was LZ West, and then we had LZ Siberia. So you had a company that would pull security on each and every one of these. And then the other two companies would be in the field um, doing maneuvers. And so it was just a rotation up the hill for a week, down into the valley for a week or more, uh, up the hill, then back down. And so my guys, and when you're on the hill, you would take sweeps off the hill to cover a certain area with uh, with uh, reports, of whatever it is. And, and so then you'd got to come back up. Uh, and so I was I was up on top of the hill when my unit came up. <coughs> And I watched them and they looked like they were, well, old to me. They looked like they were in their thirties. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, they looked like every war picture I saw of guys bedraggled and so on. And they're young guys of 19, you know, uh, 20, 21 years old, but they, some of them had that 
you know, that stare of what the heck's going on, yeah. thousand mile look. And so it, that was my first reaction. And um, then all of a sudden you become one of them and, you know, you, you go about your, you just go about your business. Uh, it would be a very scary business to me to be walking around and not, you know, it's real life stuff and life and death and people affected, you know, for a long, a lot of years. So, so here you go, you're in company C and you're operating a 40 millimeter M79 gr- grenade launcher, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah, and yes. so I don't even know what the hell that is, but it sounds impressive and crazy. But now we we come up to August 20th and you're on a patrol and next thing you know, somebody pops you in the leg uh, with a bullet, right? And you go down. Is right. That, that played? Yeah. So what, it, so what basically had taken place was that uh, we were up on one of the LZs, LZ Siberia. Yeah. Uh, sister company, sister company was in the, in the field and they had... They had been hit, and so they were in a firefight with the enemy for most of the day. Word came down. We were gonna, we were, we were going to fly down or pick us up by helicopters, fly down into the valley, you know, and and get get to them to give them support and eventually get them out of that hot spot to pull front and rear security. So that was our mission. We got on helicopters. We flew down. By the time we organized by the time we separated by the time we got um uh, a reinforced platoon and it, to 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 move out for them uh, it was late at night so about eight nine o'clock we were finally going through the jungle firefight was taking place helicopters were over firing was uh happening you could see tracer bullets going through the air and we got to them and it was quiet and all of a sudden, so we were to pull front and rear security. We had to carry some of their uh, dead out, in which we did. We were moving out. We had to cross the stream. We ran into a quick firefight down the stream. And so the word was to leave the bodies. We're moving out, uh, and we'll come back and retrieve them later on. So that was the mission we were on two days later uh, in my reinforced platoon as we're coming down and so we've just taken a break in the morning walking out on an open rice paddy now as you had made mention i carried an m79 uh, grenade launcher it was like a one-shot shotgun stubby as it was it would break into put a grenade hold it you shoot it now it was to cover areas of you know 100 150 yards away 200 yards away um that a machine gun might not reach and or small arms, AK-47s or, 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 or M-16s uh, wouldn't reach. And so you get, get heavy firepower. So we're walking out of this wooded area about eight o'clock in the morning. I was eighth in line. Word was to keep five yards distance between one another, eyes and ears open because the enemy, they're obviously they're around. And as I walked out, my point man, who is now maybe 40 yards in front of me, saw movement across the berm. And in his, he made a mistake. Rather than holding up the line, assessing the situation, taking a knee before we moved out, in his excitement, he saw the enemy, he hollered, gook, gook, shots broke the stillness, they started to run. He started to chase them and pulling everybody out in the middle of these rice paddies when a machine gun started to level the area and bodies were diving left and right to get out of the fire. Uh, and I jumped in the rice paddy in front of me, called on my hands and knees, the end of it, on another one lying below us, another out in the open, four guys were pinned out. I saw the machine gun, it was nestled 150 yards away up on the hillside. Um, so my responsibility was to breach a grenade. And as I rolled over to breach that uh, grenade, my M79, I get hit the first time uh, in my uh, left thigh. Discharged that round, not behind some protection, got enough firepower on that position to, for the four guys to get out. Um, and uh, and then we, we went back and I crawled back to where we left our commanding officer in that wooded area. About 20 minutes later, the rest of the guys crawled in on their hands and knees 
from those rice paddies filled with mud and muck. And we set up another defensive position. The enemy probed their pos- probed our position, got close enough, and I see a hand grenade come flying through the air, and it hits my commanding officer right in the middle of the back. I could see it just slowly going over and over, and boom, hits him in the back, bounces off of him, and rolls towards me, and I'm but three feet from him, and I get up to jump, and it blows up, uh, and it blows up through my right foot, knee, and thigh, and it gets him between both legs, and um, and then we were in another firefight until um, a platoon finally fought its way down. The enemy retreated, maybe because we either, you know, wounded and or killed their leader, but they all of a sudden withdrew. Thank God, for whatever reason that happened. Uh, there was a moment in time I thought we were going to be overrun um, in intensity and fire, and it just subsided. And a platoon came in and finally dragged us out of it through the night. And we finally got to a secured area where helicopters came in and took us to an aid station. And then uh, ultimately, as the story goes, I spent three weeks in Da Nang before I came back to the States. I spent nine months in the hospital and went through three more operations. All right. (laughs) There's a lot to break down right there. So I want to ask you a couple of questions. Number one, so essentially what you're telling me is you got... Um, you got hit in the leg and the thigh with, by a bullet, right? And then, right. and then shortly after that, you you have the shrapnel come off and explode from this grenade that also goes in and all over your leg. So you're just, right. you know, on, and, and at least one of your legs is is pretty messed up. During this whole period of time, um, were you able to continue to fight, or were you completely disabled? Oh, no, 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 no. So during a period of time, yeah, I took up a position on the left side and um, just in case, I mean, nothing came up that way. So there wasn't much fighting taking place. It was just the anticipation of what might happen. Then there was a barrage, and I have to tell you, this was a barrage of fire that, that all of a sudden unloaded. Uh, and, it, and it was like maybe the last charge. That's what I thought. I thought they were going to overrun our position when all of a sudden it stopped and they withdrew. Uh, for whatever reason that, that took place, as I said before, maybe we had killed their leader or 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 or, or whatever, wounded them, um, and so they just uh, withdrew. We had a we had a gunship in the area, which, which might have helped at that time, but uh, but you know you go okay, thanks. Then from that point on um then it's then when the sister platoon came in then we just you know then was dragging people out of there and we're heading back a couple clicks to get to a secured area so what is it like this is another stupid question and ignorant (laughs) but what is it like to be shot i mean what does that feel like you know when it comes into you i can't i can't even imagine that you know, and I think, I, you know, part of it, I, okay, so I, it, it was like adrenaline took over. I mean, so you get shot, you get, bam, you know, I mean, it was a hit. It was like somebody punched you as hard as they could, you know, in, in your arm or your leg. And then the second thing is that when the grenade went off, that was, you know, it blew me up in the air um, and came down. Um, and so my, you know, so my, my first thought was, okay, fine. Well, again, is everything all right? My leg was there. Okay, fine. You know, my foot hurt. Ooh, my knee hurt. Yeah. And so, uh, Doc came over, you know, and no one could give you anything. No one could give you a, a, a morphine shot at that time. I didn't get my first morphine shot until I got to where the helicopters were up on top. Hmm. So I, I got one. Oh, and I... I did not talk politely to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I understand. The, 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 and I so understand. he said, he said, I can't give you any more. I can't give you any more. He said, because you can not till you can get to the aid station because you need to talk to them. You know, you need to tell them what, what, where you've been hit and so on. I said, oh, I'll do my, <laughs> some choice words some more. But anyway, so that, uh, but, but, it, it, you know, so it's interesting and I'm not saying this. Is it, and it's you know it's like when you're climbing a mountain. I mean, you li- this is when you're climbing a mountain. 
what you're looking for is that next grab or next hole or, you know, how it, where are you putting your next spike or whatever that might be. You're not thinking about whether you're going to fall or, you know, or, you know, when you're going to get to the top. You're just thinking about that next step. And, and really, that's how we react. And, and, uh, and so, you know, there was nothing I could do about it except, you know, so my next reaction was, all right, fine, <laughs> give me something to get the pain away, you know, and eventually that took place. And um, they, and so their biggest, you know, so there at that time was that the biggest fear is infection. So the best they could do is at the aid station, you know, was wrap you, clean you. Then I went to Da Nang and I was there for two days. Um, take a look at your wounds and then wrap you again. Um, and so, uh, no, they didn't even do that. They they wrapped me the first time. I was uh, they they monitored me. <laughs> it wasn't not until I got to Tokyo uh, did they um, take the bandages off, and there was no easy way of being able to do that. So you got guys are coming in. So loads of guys are coming in, and so um, you're you're in a ward, and a good doctor comes through, and he's and you know he's got to see you, and he's got to uh, make a assessments of your injuries and so on and there's no time for x-rays or for this and it's the best that he can do and uh the doctor was dr leor uh ultimately ended up <laughs> living in indiana pennsylvania which is right outside of pittsburgh and so i got to meet him years later uh when i was back with the team but anyway so he comes in and he, he gets to me and he goes uh, uh all right fine we need to take a look at the wounds and so it's like now four or five days, the bandages have been on these wounds, not changed and, um, because no one wanted to take that risk to have an infection, kept the bandages. And, you know, there's only one way of being able to do it. <laughs> and so uh, I think I used bad language on him, too, uh, during that period of time. Understandable. <laughs> <laughs> and so and so he gave his diagnosis so so anyway i was under his care uh for uh, for three weeks until we Crazy. came back to the states yeah so 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 let me ask you something um uh i, I want to go back to where we started the pod and i asked you or i told you that i saw some of this really endearing story about you um when you went back to uh vietnam last year with Tom Rinaldi, um, the ESPN right. correspondent, and um, just relived that moment. And and having you know gone through through everything that you went through, um, the recovery, um, making it back into the NFL, and we'll touch on that in a minute. And then having this fantastic life, uh, life after football, as we say, and then going back for the first time and visiting that battleground. And, you know, I know it was really emotional for you. And I can only imagine, like, and, and something that you said, something that really touched me was, like, what is this all for? Like, at the end of the day, for what? Like, what did we gain? And, and right. the answer, I think, that you provided was really nothing, right? Outside of a lot of damaged people, you know, soldiers, right. guys. Yeah. So, you know, so anyway, part of that was... When I was asked to go back with uh, ESPN, John Fish was the producer on this, uh, and Tom Rinaldi. And I said, oh, okay, fine. I, I'd be happy to go. I, I said, I, I don't know what to expect from you guys. I mean, I don't have great expectations. I said, unlike the majority of Vietnam veterans during that period of time who had to come back in the atmosphere that was... Uh, prevalent uh, with the American people. They identified the soldier with the war, unfortunately. So they were baby killers. They were spat upon. They were thought less of. Um, and I, I said, and they had to repress their feelings. They had no place to go. They couldn't go to the VFW. They couldn't go to the American Legion. Nobody really wanted them. They didn't, it, it was a replacement more. You went over you know, a, as an individual, you came back as an individual, basically, unless you were one of the first waves that went over. But um, so it wasn't as if you trained it out together, like, and you knew the people that you were with, and you stayed in touch with them, or had a 
had a place to talk about whatever your feelings were. So that soldier came back and just repressed and went about his life the best he could um, and not deal with some of those emotional scars that took place. Now, so I came back and because I came back to try to play football, I then became a story. And so it was somewhat of a catharsis for me because why? Well, I had to answer questions. How do you feel? So from that point on, you know, um, I, 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 you know, I, I became a poster child for the Vietnam veteran and I was put on pedestals and, you know, people looked up to me and so on. So when we went back to uh, Vietnam, I had said, I, you know, I don't know what to expect. I mean, from guys. So let's just go through the process and so on. Interesting. It's 50 years later. Yeah. So we fly in and we 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 stay at a hotel, you know, and it's and I just look at it, you know, Vietnam's a you know, hustle bustle, things are, you know, picked up and and so Monday, that was a Monday morning, we're 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 driving out, we're gonna meet, we're gonna go to the Hep Duck, um, where the incident took took place. We're going to the rice paddies. They 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 they, uh, they found the location um, of exactly where the firefight had taken place. Um, that was in the logs of the, the military wherever they keep them. And so um, on our drive, it's about an hour and a half drive. Now I'm in a van with everybody else and it's air conditioned and I'm just looking at the area. And so I see highways and I see cars and I see motorbikes and I see hustle bustle, as I had made mention. And I see now townships and buildings and commerce that is taking place. Um, and as we're, as we're moving out into, um, the, uh, into the countryside and we're driving by, uh, and there's this hillside off the left and, and I said, well, what's that? And they said, well, that's LZ West. LZ West, that's where we were. You know, we used to walk off that hillside and come down into this valley, you know, and it was just jungle and rice paddies and villages and hooches. Um, and it wasn't all this that had taken place in front of me. And so, I process that not to any extent to finally get to the area where they think the rice paddies are. And now it's up to me to try to find the exact location. This whole situation 50 years before took place in, in the rice paddies. 20 minutes, maybe. I mean, it was just bam, 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 things happen like this. And so it wasn't as if we were there for days understanding the whole situation. So I'm trying to find, and maybe this is okay. It looks like it. You know, 50 years later, the rice paddies were still there. The hedgerow was still there. Okay, fine. And, you know, things have changed. Um, but, okay, fine, finally fine. And I'm saying, yeah, this is this is where it is. And so we start the interview. And we start talking about what we had talked about, how we got there and so on, what our mission was. And um, then Rinaldi asked me the question, how do I feel? Oh, wow. All of a sudden, Mark, out of left field, I get this emotional reaction from the bottom of the soles of my feet up through my, I mean, I could just feel it coming up through my body. Uh, and, 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 and I'm confused and I don't know where it's coming from or why it, it, it's there. Uh, there's nothing that triggered it except for the question of how do I feel? And I, I, I and I had, and I couldn't help myself and I, and I started to cry and it was, and I became, oh, I, and all of a sudden I became kind of sick. I, I mean, it, it, was, it was like I was flushing my system. And, oh, and I was telling Tom, I said, oh, okay. He said, you all right? Yeah, cry some more. And, 
um, and it, it go, let's go, you know, let's go back. And I try to, you know, be light about it, pick it up a little bit, the conversation as we're moving back. But now I'm feeling even worse. I mean, sick to my, to my stomach. And I go, he said, maybe we should sit down. And I sit down and bam, I pass out from an emotional reaction at that time. And so, uh, you know, so I wake up. And I have to tell you this part of it as I, as I view it, I wake up. Now there's five guys with this startled look on their face of not knowing what happened with their, <laughs> with their, their main person out. Did he die? Did he have a heart attack? What happened to him? Oh, oh my God, we can't, we can't have this on our watch. Anyway, so uh, we came to and uh, again, and uh, finally we get some liquids into me. And uh, now we got to, Ultimately, the result is that I got to go back to uh, uh, Da Nang, where we were <clears throat> into the hospital, get checked out, IVs and so on. And, uh, and, and it took me a couple days, and it took me a couple days of, of trying to figure out that emotional reaction that took place. Um, and it gave me a sense, and I'm just saying this, it gave me an insight to those military people uh, and first responders who today, because of the trauma that they had gone through, have uh, uh, post-traumatic stress. I didn't know what that meant or what that was all about. Maybe that gave me an insight of it could happen at any time, triggered at any time of a reaction that took place for me 50 years ago for a lot of people periodically over there over you can you can walk out of a door and all of a sudden step off a cliff and that's what it felt like um on that day and so uh trying to rationalize and as we go through it again and as i was talking about it and i suppose in my mind seeing the changes you know understanding that it's still a police state it's a communist country um, they love Americans and, um, it, 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 it's, it's a growing capitalism is, 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 is going great there. Um, and we got great relationships and so on. So that was then the question, you know, why, why, you know, um, did we lose 58,000 soldiers during that period of time? Uh, and the question was, for what? Not that they died in vain, but for what ultimately? And uh, who knows if we hadn't been there, what that area would be like today? Maybe because we were there, although and it left, um, it is better off than it had been. Um, but for me, it was why for those who had given their lives for what reason so that was my emotional thing yeah and no, i get it and you know again from beginning to end and end being 50 years later it's a traumatic emotional experience no i, I don't think there's any other way you can slice that it just is what oh. it is um and it's certainly understandable how anybody would have a similar reaction kind of re-triggered um, to activate all those memories where you probably had other buddies down there that, that died and tragically or wounded or something else um, in addition to your own struggles. And again, going back to the name of this podcast, Finding Your Summit, People Overcoming Adversity and Finding Their Way, it's just an amazing run because, we, again, we, we go back to the timestamp that you know, you're drafted in 1968. By December uh, 2nd, I think you said 1968, you're now drafted in the war. So now we're into 1969 and like within four or five months of when all this was happening, I mean, here you are playing against Cleveland or somebody. And six months later, you're standing in the rice field and getting shot at. And, and now another year, now we get into 1970 and you're invited to go back and, and come back on the, to the Steeler team. And of course, like all of us, you have to try out. You just, you don't get the green light and just go. And you have to fight your way back at the same time. You're, 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 you know, like half your foot's gone or something. And, you know, right. you're, and, and, and so they end up putting on the injured reserve. But I mean, again, it just, 
going back to where we started this whole podcast about a little kid growing up in Appleton, Wisconsin, son of a Catholic um, uh, family, and going on to Notre Dame, um, being around the right influences, having that that winning mentality, never giving up. These things all count when your best is required, right? And right. it seems like that happened along with kind of the same convergence that happened to you in high school. You said it was a brand new high school. It was a brand new coach, Torchy something, that you know won every single football game that you ever had. You went on to Notre Dame. Um, and you end up winning the national championship your junior year. And, and, and so and now you get on the Steeler team, Franco Harris, Lynn Swan, John Stallworth, Terry Bradshaw, Mean Joe Green. I mean, all these crazy, fantastic linebackers, safeties. I mean, it, you guys were just loaded, right? And you happened to be on that team in the right moment. Right. And the right, you know, and you think about it and you pinch yourself and so on and so on. But in the beginning, you know, and and I think one of the things by reaching a summit and so on are the things that you learn or we have learned um, in no matter what we do, but in, in, in playing organized sports. You know, I always tell people this. I said, you play in the backyard, you play in the neighborhood, you know, you grow up as a kid. There's certain things, hopefully, that you learn, which is that you never get unscathed you'll never get out of out of childhood unscathed i mean you have you fall down you have bruises you have scrapes you know and so you're playing in the backyard you know and then you pull a muscle you twist your ankle and uh, um or you get osgood schlatter's disease or you get a you know a broken bone here and so on but there's a process in which you learn which is oh it hurts secondly it has to heal so you see a doctor you know, and then you got to rehab and then you go back and you play. We do it time and time again as we grew up in the neighborhoods and, and then um, on the playing fields. So in your mind, that becomes kind of the, the process. So for me, coming back was that, all right, let's be honest. I didn't lose a limb. I didn't lose a, a leg. I didn't lose an arm. So in my mind, damage, hey, yeah, but we've been damaged before. It's just the process of having to go through the healing process, through the, 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 the rehab process, the build-up process, and get yourself back in shape. And so it's the only thing that you know. So a, you get an opportunity when I was in the military um, to be able to do that. Um, I was an outpatient, so I had a job in which I had to show up every day. but. I go see my doctor, I go to my job, um, I, I, I come back, I, I, I try to sprint as I best possibly can, you know, I'd get up in the morning, I'd go run uh, at five o'clock because we had to be at uh, on post at seven o'clock. And, um, and so you just get into that kind of mode and you do what you kind of have to do. Um, and so... I go back and I get out of the service and uh, go back to the Steelers and and, um, uh, and so you got a so you get a support mechanism you know and I go to training camp I asked if I can go to training camp you know can I go to training camp and, and, and maybe I went back too soon who knows and, and it took its toll and took its beating and I, you know they kept me they kept me to the last cut and um, so um, they they they. Chuck Knoll said, listen, we're going to put you on, we, 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 we release you, go home, heal, do what you need to be do, come back next year, we'll give you, you know, another shot at this. The following day, I got a call from Dan Rooney, who was then president of the football club, and he said, I, I'm sorry I wasn't there. He said, I talked to Chuck, we're not going to take any room in his roster. He said, but we're going to put you in injured reserve, I want our doctors to take a look at you again. Um, and I think maybe there's something that they can do that hopefully you can help us towards the end of the season. So they bought me a year and the following year I came back a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger, got a year of healing and so on. And, um, uh, that it pulled a muscle and so they, they put me on the taxi squad, the developmental squad. Yep. So basically, it bought my two years of an opportunity to heal, to get stronger, to hang around, to see the growth and the change and so on. And so when I come back now in 1972, 
I was bigger, stronger, healed, better, so on, and back playing. So I made the team, playing special teams specifically. Um, and, and, and primarily, I think, because they could see the change in what they saw when, they, when I came back and, uh, and the hard work that that one put in and so on. And ultimately, what I learned through this process in overcoming your summits or whatever is that you can only do what you can do. I can't guarantee myself being, because one of the things that you don't want uh, is to ever uh, look back and say, what if? Basically, from my point of view, I wanted to erase all those what ifs. What if I would have gotten up earlier? What if I would have worked harder? What if I would have ran more? What if I would have lifted more? Um, and so in, in my prospect is I can't dictate whether I'm going to make the team or not. I can't dictate uh, what's going to happen on those practice fields or what the coaching staff is looking for or ownership is looking for. All I can do is do the best that I can be so that hopefully, hopefully you, you don't want to say later on in life, geez, if I would have done this, I might have been able to do it. So the more ifs you could erase, the better off you're going to be if for whatever reason that end result doesn't turn out to be the one you wanted. But in my case, so I come back and, and I get, you know, and I work out and I get bigger and I get stronger and I get faster and I get, get a chance to, uh, you know, to, 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 to make the team um, and um, playing special teams again and going back and doing those things that you, you need to be. And then ultimately what happens is that they see now over a period of time, a growth pattern, a change um, that you've gotten better or that you've gotten bigger or that you've gotten faster or the way you looked here. And then all of a sudden, you know, and this was 1974, um, Franco Harris was a starting fullback. Preston Pearson, Frenchie Fuqua. I was the fifth running back uh, out of four at the beginning of that season. But Franco gets hurt. The backup becomes the starter. And I become the backup to the backup. Pretty good. I had not been there before in my career yeah. so far. Three games later, there's a fourth game of the season. The backup gets hurt. So I'm inserted in the game. Um, and I get to uh, and I get to start. And as a team, we win that game. Following week, um, everybody's still banged up, so I get to start that week uh, with Preston Pearson, who I'd mentioned mentioned before. And as a team, we win that game. And the week thereafter, uh, Franco becomes healthy, um, and we have a pregame meal. And I'm you know back being a backup again. And at the pregame meal, the coach says, Franco, you and Rock will start tonight. Unbeknownst to me, nobody told me that. I was going to play the other running back position. And ultimately, we get to start uh, that game. And as a team, we, we win that game. And so we get to start the following week. And as a team, we win that game. And we restart the remaining part of that season. And we win the division. We go to the playoffs. We win the playoffs. We go to the Super Bowl for the first time. And we win the Super Bowl. And we get play six more years thereafter in that backfield and win three more Super Bowls. In 1976, Franco and I become the second set of running backs in the history of the NFL, each to gain 1,000 yards rushing in one season. And after 12 years, well, then I, I, I retire. But the interesting thing here is ultimately the reason, the reason that I got a chance to play to begin with, not necessarily the injury that had taken place but prior to that breakout group that I had mentioned before, Chuck Knoll had asked our backfield or our, our running back coach, he said, you have a weakness in your backfield. Who is your best blocker? He said, Blyer. He said, then start him. One talent. And so it reminds me of the fact, and it always does, is the talents that we bring to our lives, to our quests, to uh, the summits that we overcome, because we all have a talent of one nature or another of how we can achieve and get to that point. And you have to understand what that talent may be, different than anybody else's, but it's yours specifically in what you do. And uh, because of that one talent, 
you know, my life came full circle, got that opportunity um, to be able to to play and um, and end up uh, playing on one of the all time great football teams. Yeah, you guys might have been the the decade of the uh, the team of the decade of the seventies or something, and all those players that I named before. But you know, you said it beautifully in terms of um, you know you can only con- control what you can control, and if you don't go after your dreams with true belief in yourself, you don't know what your ultimate potential is going to be, right? And right. I did the exact same thing. You were 180 80 pounds going into the NFL. And then, you know, through all this hard work and everything, you end up becoming 212 pounds and looking like these backs today. I mean, you know, big and strong and physical and you look like the part, but you didn't necessarily look like the part. And, you know, your running style and everything else wasn't the most beautiful thing, but you just knew what to do, when to do it. You had a key block in one of those Super Bowls uh, when Brad shot the ball right down the middle in a post. And again, it's all these different pieces and parts coming together to create the foundation of something really successful. And it's always so satisfying too when there's 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 individual success, but that leads to team success. Whether it's in business, which I know you've had a big hand in um, post football, um, to to athletic success, or even success, you know, when you're in Vietnam working as a team unit, going up and down those different. Um, rice paddy fields and everything else that you guys were marching around in so that's right. what it takes to you know I, I say all the time it takes a little more to make a champion and that's what you literally have to do that's, it takes a little more right that's right you know and you and you know the people that you surround yourself with have become very important your teammates become very important um in in, in to give you the support that you need and sometimes a pat on the back and um and sometimes a lift uh, and give you a hand when you when you fumble the football or they pick you up off the field and say, don't worry about it, you know, we'll get it uh, together. Um, you know, so it, it's all those things that encompass, but what you said becomes very important and it's how you view yourself and what you want to get accomplished and trying to be as honest as you possibly can with yourself to the talents that you have and, uh, and, uh, and, and set, you know, set forth. Now, if you're, five foot nine and a half, like me, you also have to be realistic. You're never going to play center for the Celtics <laughs> <laughs> or in the NBA, okay? <laughs> That'll never, so let's be realistic about those goals and what you can do and where you are and what you want to get, a, get, a, get, a, get, a, get achieved ultimately. Um, and so I think that becomes very important. And and how we see ourselves uh, moving forward in any direction that we go. But basically, the biggest story, yours, well, as well, is, is, having, is having a sense that you can do something, having a sense that you can accomplish it. Uh, you know, you weren't born, let me just you weren't born a mountain climber. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it was something you wanted to do, and, and what an achievement. I, 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 I walked up one of the... When I forget one of the fourteen, one of for the fourteeners yeah. uh, over in Colorado, and that was enough. <laughs> I got up once, and that was it. So I understand what you know, when 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 you decide you want to go and climb, you know, wherever, and so it's a, it's an amazing event. Well, it's been a fun uh, way for me to continue to set goals post my NFL life after football days. And I've been involved in a lot of different things, but, you know, pushing yourself, continuing to set high goals and then going after them, you know, a full gusto has been really satisfying. And really, I think like, like all these things um, we go back in, I I know you've had different segments in your life, but um, for, um, when you're put in that position or you put yourself in those positions, some of the amazing people that can also enter your life to really help define and shape where you're trying to go as well has been really, you know, fulfilling uh, and things I would have never anticipated or expected, you know, going into both football and it's just right. like you, you know, success breeds success. So my grade school went to high school, my high school went to college. You know, I played at a very successful place at Washington with Don James And then that went to the Raiders and the Raiders went to the Saints. And, you know, it's just all these places I happen to go. It's just meeting amazing people and helping to shape who I am today 
which is then fostered into some of the success or at least the drive that I've had towards trying to climb these different mountains. And it doesn't always go right. Right. I mean, you have that right. all and other things you've done. It's, you know, and I, and you know, I think what's so important is that we're really only people, you know, I mean, we're just people, you know, we're not, we're not super people. We're not, you know, extraordinary people, but he, and I look at my teammates and I look at this and some have size, but they lack other things, you know, some have speed, but they don't have, uh, you know, great hands, but they do, you know, so it's, it's really finding the, what you have, the finding and how you fit in and what you bring to your community, your family, your business, your, your dreams of what you want to get accomplished. Don't compare them to other people. Don't think that other people are smarter. They may be. I understand that because people are smarter than me. But, you know, hopefully you find your niche, your talents, and your dreams. And, and, and those are the things that you got to push. you got to push because you really don't ever want to get back to uh, get to a point in your life when you look back and you say, I should have. I should have. God, I would have. Oh, I, you know, man, I missed out on this. And, you know, and you're going to miss out some things, but, you know, you got to keep that dream alive of what you want to get accomplished. Absolutely. What it could have, should have, doesn't get you anywhere, right? One of the things I want to do yeah. as we kind of round third base here is I, I do want to plug your book, um, Fighting Back. Oh, thank you. Well, I know. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, we, and, and, you know, I'm not the type of person, I don't like to run podcasts where I promote books, but I do think your story is really fascinating about achievement, about going after things, about not having all the cards in the deck, about, you know, having yeah. bad things happen and then you overcoming those things. So it's called Fighting Back, the Rocky Blyer story. It's, uh, there's actually an audio book um, and you can find it at Amazon, mm -hmm. Audible and uh, Apple Books. And uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Now, now that everybody's sequestered in their homes and so on, so not knowing what they can do, so now you can, you know, get a book or do it on audio tape. And so, yeah, no, I love that. I thank you. I thank you for the plug. I think, but I think the important thing also is that for people, for people to be able to read stories about people's lives, you know, not to compare them, but just to understand that the majority of them are just normal people that, you know, have had a dream or, you know, and, and, um, and had some talent of one nature that doesn't make it any different than who you are, but, you know, pushed uh, forward. And so they're, 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 they're encouraging. I mean, books of that nature are encouraging for you to read so that you can compare yourself. Yeah, I love that. Well, listen, uh, you've been an absolute champ. It took me a while to get you on the pod, but I was really <laughs> relentless. Thank you. Like a defensive back trying to chase you down on the field, I finally caught you and got you on the pod. And uh, nothing but success to you in the future, and, and good luck with your book. And uh, hopefully we can stay in touch, but certainly want to promote this to everybody um, that's out there uh, so that they can be inspired by things and people like you doing amazing, amazing stuff in life. Thank you, Mark. It's a, it's a pleasure, and we will stay in touch. Thanks. All right, buddy. All right, he is Rocky Blair. Thank you so much. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because as you know everybody has their own summit that they're going after okay if you're looking to follow my journey you can find that through my social links on mark pattison nfl.com that's mark m-a-r-k -M pattison p-a-t-t-i-s-o-n nfl.com so until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye.